Somebody open your mouth and give God a praise in this house. Come on, somebody that loves the Lord and you're not ashamed, open your mouth to Jesus Christ. Now wait, now wait, just in case there's somebody that's sitting around you who's not sure what's about to happen in the next few minutes, would you just look at him or hunt him and tell him, neighbor, I don't know about you, but God's been too good to me for me to be quiet about it. So you got to excuse me for a minute while I give the Lord a praise. Now go ahead and praise him like you want to. Come on. Praise him like you want to. This is Revival Wednesday. I dare you to praise him like you lost your mind. I dare you to praise him like you're going to chase that devil out of here. to me. Listen, lift your hands. Lift your hands right here. In this moment right here. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. He has established his name and he will reign forever. Hey, my God, he will reign over everything that may be trying to confront you. He reigns. He's established his name. And he will reign forever. He reigns over heart conditions. He reigns over finances. He reigns over addictions. He reigns over depression. He reigns over COVID. You don't hear me. He reigns. Somebody lift your hand and say he reigns. Father, in this atmosphere, I pray that you would have your way today. I step out of the way and ask you, God, to step up. Do what you do in this place. Holy Spirit, throw your weight around. Send deliverance in this house. Send breakthroughs in this house. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Clap your hands and give God praise one more time, why don't you? Well, hello, Way World Outreach Church. My God, I'm home. You may be seated. I'm glad to be back home at the Way World Outreach. I'm so glad I missed y'all. Amen. Look, give it up for Pastor Marco and Lady Lisa. Amen. The wonderful leaders of this church, the visionaries of this church, and all the leaders, amen, of this church. Give God praise for all of them. Amen. And would y'all do something very special for me? Some of you don't know this, but I'm pastoring a church in Nashville, Tennessee, called the Impact Church of Nashville. And they're watching me online right now. They stayed up. We're on a different line. Would you help me welcome them that are watching me online? Help me welcome my church family. Amen. They stayed up just so they could watch us and support us in the service. Amen. Amen. So this is Revival Wednesday, and I came to bring a word from the Lord for you tonight to add to this conversation so if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 49. Ah, pray for me. I hear you. Genesis, chapter 49. We're going to begin reading at verse 22 to verse 24. 
I'm going to be reading out the English Standard Version, so it may sound just a little bit differently, but there's only a couple of passages of Scripture there. And if you pray for me that God would release me to tell it to you like he told it to me. This is the challenge of every preacher, to try to say it to you like God says it to us. And sometimes somewhere between him speaking and the vessel, it can be a little bit frustrating because can't nobody out preach Jesus. <laughs> we, we do our very best to convey it in the very best way we can, but nobody can out preach Jesus. So pray for me that I'll do my very best to tell you what he told me to say to the church. Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. It reads this way. It says, Joseph is a fruitful vine. A fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. <laughs> his strong arms stayed limber. Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Yeah. And I want to use for a simple subject tonight, don't let life break you. Yeah. I don't know who that's for. Is that for somebody here? I don't know. I can't tell with these lights. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let life break you. It might shake you. It might knock you down. It might wear you up. But don't let life break you. Let it break you. Father, bless your word on tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph's life is a lesson in triumph over tragedy. His life is an example of what God can do in your life and what your life can look like. Here it is. If you don't allow negative situations to overwhelm you. If you don't allow disappointments to define you. If you don't allow bad breaks to overshadow God's plans for you. If you don't let life make you, get this, bitter, cynical, pessimistic. If you don't allow yourself to become mired in the mud of bad experiences and have your future clouded from possibilities, God can turn your tragedy into a triumph. Come on, say amen. Because here's what you need to know, beloved. If you let it, I keep telling that word allow, because if you let it, life will break you. Because look here, life happens to everybody. Things happen. All of us experience things that, that knock us to our knees. All of us do. We experience things that will knock the very wind out of you. Things that will make you crumble under the weight of pressure and problems and issues and challenges. Life happens to everybody. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Yeah, young and old, black or white, rich or poor, life just happens. But here's the thing. When you get knocked down, as we often do, the temptation is to stay down. Getting knocked down may be life, but staying down is a decision. All of us get knocked down sometimes by something. Sometimes things catch us unawares. Sometimes things we did not expect knock us down. But the decision, but the decision to stay down is totally up to you. And this is what I found out. This is what I found out. When things knock you down, you got to fight your way up. I mean, you got to fight your way up. You got to get mad and get determined to get back up because if you let life keep you down, you got to get up before life gets you used to being down. You're not going to talk to me in here. You got to get up before you get used to being down. I may be broke right now, but I'm not going to get used to it. I may be sick right now, but I'm not going to get used to it. I may be frustrated right now, but I'm not going to get used to it. I may be unemployed right now, but I'm not going to get used to it. You got to fight your way up. You got to scratch your way up. And if you can't get up, you got to have enough nerve to at least look up. I will look to the hills from where it's coming my help because my help hunt somebody say look up 
If you can't get up, at least look up. Because wherever you put your eyes, that's where your life is going to go. Look at somebody say, you got to lift your eyes up. Oh, that's the word for somebody right now. You're in some situation right now, God said up. That's your word right now. If you're broke right now, God said up. If you're sick right now, God said up. That's your word for tonight. If you're depressed right now, God said up. Somebody shout up. I want you to shout it at the top of your lungs because no matter what got you down right now, you are determined that you're going to get up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to come up out of it. I'm going to get away from it. I'm going to make up my mind. If I got to drag myself, if I got to yank myself by one leg, if I got to crawl on my belly, I am determined that I'm going to get up. Somebody shout up. That was a word for somebody right there. I don't know who I'm talking to. Am I talking to you? Shout at your boy. In our text, the patriarch Jacob, on his deathbed, begins to prophesy to his sons. And particularly, he speaks to Joseph. And he calls him a fruitful bow, whose branches will climb over the walls. That simply means that his influence will be extended beyond his current situation. And aren't you glad that God is so busy looking at your future that he's saying to you that although you're planted over here, your influence will reach over there. Aren't you glad that it doesn't matter where you start? That you may have been brought, you may have started in a bad situation. You may have started in a bad neighborhood. You may have even started in a questionable family. But no matter where God started my story, this is not where my story is going to end. My branches will reach over the wall. Look at somebody and say, I'm going to have greater than this. My branches will reach over the walls. It, 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 will, it, will come, it will overcome barriers. It will overcome obstacles. It will stand up against things that said I couldn't get out of it. it. It will break all kinds of stereotypes and say my branches will go over the wall. I, it doesn't matter if my family was poor. What matters is that God is going to make me rich. You're not going to talk to me. And so Jacob prophesies to his son and says, I know it wasn't easy. Anybody who's ever achieved anything significant in life knows that it wasn't easy. We make it look easy, but in reality, it wasn't easy. It's not easy to hold your family together. It's not easy to build your business. It's not easy to build your ministry. We make it look easy because you're sitting out there watching from over there. And when we stand up and do what we do, we make it look easy. That's why people always try to jump up and do what you do because you make it look easy. <laughs> and they look at you and say, well, I can do that until they get to do it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever heard somebody try to tell you how to raise your kids when they didn't have no kids? Talking about what they said they would do, what I would do. Right, this is what I would do if I was a parent until they have some. But here's what Jacob begins to recognize. This is something that I all want you all to reckon with. He says, I know it was easy, but I also know that the archers shot at me. It wasn't easy because you had some archers, some killers, some hit men that were shooting at you. <laughs> they, 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 I, I, love how, I love how diplomatic Jacob is with all his sons standing around him, see? He's got all these kids standing around him, and, and, and you know how it is. I don't want to call you by name, so I'm just going to call you the archers. And sometimes you have people around you. You don't want to call them by name. You just want to call them the archers. <laughs> we got some archers in this room, Pastor. We, we, we got some folks that I know were shooting at me, and I don't want to call nobody out. I don't want to out nobody. I'm going to call them by my name. I'm just going to call them the archers. You know, the people that spread little stuff about you, they say little things about you, they, they tried to do whatever they could to kill your influence, and it didn't work. And, they, and, see, and see, what they don't know is that God already revealed to you who did it and who said it, and it's not that you didn't know who did it and who said it, it's just that you're too big to be that low. 
I got too much class to answer that kind of foolishness, so I'm just going to call them the archers. I know your name. I know your name is Mary. I know your name is Fred. I know your name is Billy, but I ain't going to call you out. I'm not going to out you in front of these people. I'm just going to call them the archers. Anybody got some archers in here? Maybe you got some archers in your family. Maybe you got some archers on your job. They're they trying to mess up your opportunity. They're spreading bad news about you, and they're trying to kill you from getting that next promotion. And De Jacob says, I know you have some archers. They shot at you. See, this is normal. What's normal for people of destiny is that the enemy will shoot at you. I wish I could tell you that if you get saved or delivered or start living right, that you won't have any archers, any haters, nobody trying to stop you, nobody trying to prevent you. But the truth of the matter is God never promised you that you wouldn't have enemies. He never promised you that you wouldn't have an enemy who was attempting to destroy you. What God does promise you as no weapon formed against you. I didn't promise you that they wouldn't form the weapon. I didn't promise you that they wouldn't try it. I didn't promise you that they wouldn't set you up. I'm just telling you that whatever they did, it didn't work. Is there anybody glad that whatever the devil tried to do? It's not that he didn't try to mess me up. It just didn't work. He fired it and he missed his mark. So you, you understand something about this, that if the enemy is shooting at you in any area of your life, he's not playing with you. He's not trying to just maim you. He's really trying to kill you. See, you don't th see the devil don't just, just shoot at you for fun. He's not just trying to have something to do with his time. That if the enemy is trying, is shooting at you in every area of your life, in any area of your life, he's trying to kill you. But here's what you need to know, that whatever the, trip the devil tried to do, it didn't work. I'm still here. By the grace of God, I'm still here. I've been shot at, but I'm still here. I've been lied on, but I'm still here. I've had traps set for me, but I'm still here. They tried to fire me off my job, but I'm still here. They tried to set my name up, but I'm still here. They ran me down in the street, but I'm still here. Family turned their back on me, but I'm still here. I cried, but I'm still here. I was lonely, but I'm still here. I was depressed, but I'm still here. Lost my job, but I'm still here. Lost my marriage, but I'm still here. Lost my house, but I'm still here. Is there anybody glad that you're still here? Give God a shout. Sit down, sit down, hold on. See, some of you have to understand that you are the Joseph in your family. And when the enemy knows that you are a person of destiny, he tries to get you early. That's why some of the things that happen to you happen to you so early in life. Because the enemy knew what you was going to be. He knew what was going to come out of your life, so he tried to catch you early with addictions. He tried to catch you early with family struggles. He tried to catch you early with all these sort of things that tried to take you out. He tried because he knew that if you ever got up, you were going to be a world shaker. You were going to be a planet shaker. All my planet shakers make some noise in here if you know what I'm talking about. He tried to catch you early in your development. And here's what I want to say to you also. Sometimes it wasn't even about you. But in reality, he was looking down the road at your generations. That like Joseph, you were going to be the link between what your family was and what your, sh your family shall be. You were going to be the turning point. You were going to be the pivoting point. You were going to be the one that was going to change your generation. Let me make it plain for you. You were going to be the curse breaker in your family. You were going to be the one to break the curse of addiction over your family. You were going to be the one to break the curse of divorce over your family. You were going to be the one to break the curse of poverty over your family. Where are my curse breakers at? Make some noise. But tell that devil it didn't work. 
rap about three people say it didn't work. 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 Listen, why y'all keep jumping up? I've never, I've never met a great person with a great anointing who didn't have great pain somewhere in their life. I never have. I've never met somebody who's had a great anointing who didn't have some great pain somewhere in their life. It may not be apparent. It may not be obvious. It may not be easy to detect. It may be disguised and hidden and moved somewhere where you can't even figure it out. But anybody who's ever had a great anointing, trust me, had great pain somewhere. But what I'm saying to you is that if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make you better. Somebody said this. They said this. They said that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Then in reality, the success in your life does not is not determined by your lack of problems, your lack of issues, your lack of challenges. But in reality, your success in life has everything to do with how you respond to it. It's how you respond that determines whether or not you're going to come out of it. It's how you respond that determines how long this test will last. It's how you respond to it that determines whether or not you'll have the victory over it or it'll have the victory over you. But believe me, what God does with the pain, with the archers in your life, is God uses it to, number one, write this down, to propel you. God uses pain not to stop you, but to propel you. Look at this. Joseph enjoyed all the privileges, the power, and the prestige of being a favorite son of the house. He had the distinction of wearing the coat of many colors. And on top of all that, he had a dream that he shared with his brothers about one day running everything. So you got to be careful about who you share your dreams with. See, see, some things that God tells you, he meant for you to keep it for yourself. See, the problem with some of you is sometimes you're talking too much. Can I say that? Can I say that amongst family? You talk too much. Listen, God's trying to tell you something. This ain't no conference call. This is personal. This is private. This is between you and him. This is something that God wanted to convince you of. But by the time you told eight, nine, and ten people, and they're trying to kill you before you even get started, then you understand it's not about them. If I was trying to talk to them, God said I would talk to them. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. Sometimes when I'm shouting, you don't even know what I'm really shouting about. Come on, somebody. Sometimes when I'm lifting my hands, you don't even understand what I'm even talking about. It's between me and God and God and me, and I'm excited about something God's already shown me. I ain't got to tell you. This is personal. This is private. This is between me and God. This is something that God promised me. It has nothing to do with you. But when we talk too much, you open the door up for folk to try to mess up what God is trying to do. See, everybody, everybody talks about having favor. Oh, I got favor. I got favor. But favor comes, look at this, favor comes with a burden. Favor comes with a burden. You're walking around, Joseph, with your coat of many colors on, but having that fi- kind of favor comes with the burden. It comes with the burden of people hating you for no reason. It comes with the burden of people hating on you for no reason. Having this coat of many colors on and having this kind of favor attracts the attack of the enemy. It makes you an easy target. Is there anybody in here that knows it's like to be an easy target? Have you ever been somebody who wondered, I'm just being myself. I'm just being my normal self. I don't understand why you hate me. I'm not even a big person. I'm not even famous. I'm not even a pastor. I'm not even up front of in front of everybody. I'm not, I'm not even nobody special. I got, a, I, got a, I got a little car. I got a little house. I have a little bit of influence. And you putting this great big attack on the little old me, it's because you got favor on you. The, the demons know there's something on you. Your enemies know there's something on you. Look at somebody say, there's something on me. There's something on me. The brothers, 
He attracted their jealousy, their hatred, because, took a, look at this, once you get this, because they didn't see him as a future savior. They only saw him as a favorite son. People don't handle you right because they don't perceive you right. People don't handle you right because they don't perceive you correctly. To them, they're just hating on you because of what you have. And sometimes, here's this, check this out. Sometimes people that know you the best disrespect you the most. Because they have a hard time perceiving God on you or God's future with you. They only see who you are. Sometimes, here's what I'm saying. Sometimes people, they treat you uh, depending on where they met you at the time. And depending on where they met you, that's how they treat you. That's their perception of you. So you met me at a bad place. You met me at a bad time. You met me in a backslidden state. You met me as a drug addict. You met me having challenges. And so it's hard for people to perceive you as something greater when they only deal with you based on where they met you. And how dare you think that you know me that well, that you can tell what I'm going to be. How dare you think that you can speak against my destiny when God is the only one who has the secret to my future? How dare you try to know me after the flesh and not recognize that there's an anointing on my life? I'm more than you think I am. I'm greater than you think I am. Don't you dare judge me by what I wear or what I drive or where I live. There is something down in me that is called to greatness. Where are my great people out that you're called? Give God a praise. Look at what I say. You don't know me. You don't know me like that. How dare you think you know me like that? Because you met me at this certain place. Sometimes people who even live in your same house don't know you. Siblings don't know you that well. You could be married to somebody and they not know you that well. You can be on the same job with somebody and they don't know you that well. You don't know me like that. Look at somebody say, you don't know me like that. Paul said this. He said, no, no man after the flesh. And the problem many of us is that we're trying to deal with people after the flesh. I know Mary. I know her background. I know where she's from. That's why you got to hang out with God. Because he's the only one who has the secret to your future. He's the only one who knows what you shall be. And sometimes and all the time, he hides his glory in earthen vessels. He hides his anointing in unlikely people. He hides his gifts in people that you wouldn't pick for the team. He hides his anointing in people that you wouldn't have on your side. That's why you got to be careful how you deal with people. Sometimes you're entertaining angels unawares. That's just Derek. That's just Jimmy. That's just Fred. But down inside of me is something so strong that if I let this thing loose, the whole place is going to collapse. Somebody open your mouth and give God praise if you got something down. Somebody touch your belly and say, I got something down in me. I got something down in me. I got something down in me. I got a glory down in me that's got to get out. Lift your hands and open your mouth if you got a glory that's got to get out. It's got to get out. Matter of fact, let's take a praise break right here. If somebody has got a praise and you got to get it out, take 30 seconds and give him praise right here. I got to get this out. 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 You might to excuse me. I'm going to get this out. I got to get this out. I got to let this out of me. I got to let Here's what I found out, that sometimes when there's a prophecy hanging over your life, that sometimes instead of your life progressing, sometimes it looks like my life is digressing. Look at Joseph, who went from a prophecy, from a dream, to a pit. 
You would have thought that once he got a dream of greatness, that his life would go up and start moving forward. But instead of his life moving forward, his life began to digress. I want to talk to somebody in here who's got a prophecy over your life, but your life doesn't seem to be going in the right direction. I know I heard God say I'm going to be the head and not the tail. I heard him say it clearly, but they started laying people off on my job. I know God said that I was going to get out of the situation, but it looked like my life is being pulled back. Instead of my life going forward, my life is being pulled back back. And I want to talk to somebody in here who feels like your life is going in the opposite direction to what God has been saying to you. Am I talking to anybody in here? But here's what I want you to know. Your life is like an arrow being pulled back in a bow. Somebody hears me. The further I pull you back, let me go over this side because I'm not sure. If you feel like your life is being pulled back, God said the further I pull you back, when I release you, when I release you, I'm going to propel you further than you ever Somebody do this for me. That's what God said. I'm pulling you back. Because I'm about to let you go. Somebody shout go. Go. I'm getting up out of this situation. I'm coming out of these circumstances. God's about to propel me. Everything that God has allowed to happen in your life that makes you feel like your life is going backwards. God said, don't let the pain discourage you. I'm just pulling you back. And the further I pull you, I know you're watching other people go ahead of you and look like everybody is getting in their blessing before you. And something down in you is wondering, God, when is going to be my turn? But God said, don't be no hater. And don't be jealous because some of the people that are laughing at you now are going to be looking at you from the backside as God propels you past. Oh, my God. I got to get out of here. Y'all don't hear me. As God begins to take you further and get you there faster, look at somebody and say, you better watch me. You better watch me. You better watch me. So God used pain to propel. Joseph. I know it doesn't look like it, but the pit was the propulsion point. And I want to talk to somebody right now who feels like your life is in a pit, buried, covered up, unnoticed, overlooked, disrespected, pushed aside, watching everybody. Everybody's getting married but me. Everybody's starting a business but me. Everybody's going forward in their ministry but me. Everybody's buying a house but me. Everybody's discovering their gifts and talents but me. And sometimes it makes you feel like, what's wrong with me? But God said, there's nothing wrong with you. I had to hide you for a season. If I didn't hide you, the enemy was going to do something nefarious to you. So sometimes God holds you back. It's out of mercy. He's not mad at you. It's mercy. If you came out too soon, they would kill you. If you came out too soon, they mess up your business. If you came out too soon, they shut you down. But God said, for a while, I'll hide you. Is there anybody know that like to be hidden by God? I mean so hidden they'll be standing around you and can't find you. Look at somebody and say, I'm not being buried. I'm being planted. There's a difference between being buried and being planted. See, when you bury something, you don't expect it to come back. You pronounce the benediction over it. You put it in the ground. You say it's over. But when you plant something, 
you put it in the ground with an expectation. It's the same thing. It's the same action. It's just the expectation is different. Is there anybody in here that knows that I've been planted? I'm not buried. I've been planted. And when the time is right, God is going to raise me. Somebody give him praise if you know that God is going to raise you. I mean, make some noise if you know God is going to raise you. All the way in the back, shout if you know God is going to raise you. Second thing, God used pain to prepare him. See, we prefer, we prefer to be prepared in ideal situations. We want to be prepared in ideal circumstances. We want to be prepared in universities, in schools, and training facilities. We want to be prepared amongst people that we know and that we love. But here was Joseph sold into the hands of Gentiles, working as a slave in Potiphar's house. Got set up by somebody and got lied on and ended up in prison. I want to talk to somebody who's suffering at the hands of somebody who lied. Who set you up? Wasn't even your fault. That you are the victim of somebody else's dysfunction. It's not your issue. It's not your problem. You are the victim of somebody else's dysfunction. Somebody else's ineptitude. Somebody else's inability to follow instructions or handle their feelings or handle their emotions. And you are now the victim of somebody else's dysfunction. And here he was trying to be a man of integrity, standing up against somebody who had no integrity. And when it all boiled down, you ended up carrying the load. And in, the, and in all places to train God's great man, he did it in prison. I would have thought you would have sent Joseph to a university. To a school of prophets, to a business school. I mean, you're about to become a great leader. And instead of God sending you to a university, to a seminary, to a great training school, he sent you to prison. And there in the prison, God began to hone his gift. God will put you in the unlikeliest places to develop your gift. God will put you in the strangest places Amongst the weirdest people, how is it, God, you got me on this job to train my gift? Maybe you're not in a physical prison. Maybe you're in an emotional prison. Maybe you're in a financial prison. Maybe you're in a psychological prison. But it's a prison nonetheless. You're restricted. You can't move like you want to move. You can't do like you want to do. And you want God to put you in an easy place where you can learn these skills and these gifts. But God sometimes puts you in the weirdest places, in the weirdest situations. Sometimes God is preparing you in the place that one day you will run. Come on, I came in the job on an entry level, and they're taking me through all kind of drama. But instead of getting mad and running off, just understand that God is training me. Training me to give instruction. Training me to learn how to be on time. Training me, teach me how to be a man in this situation. Somebody in here, God saying, I'm training you. You cussing. You're mad. You're frustrated. But this is the place that I chose to train you. Uh, I done stole that joy, Marco. I, I, I'm training you in that community. I'm training you through that marriage. Oh, my Lord. I'm training you on that job. I'm training you in this church. See, we're living in a place now that people don't want to go to churches that train you. They want to go to churches that play with you, that tickle you, that make you feel good, let you do anything you want to do. Act any kind of way. Do anything you want to do. do. Do anything you want to do and still be a Christian. Me and God got a special relationship. Yeah, that's what they tell you. Me and God got an understanding. And if you step to them with discipline, if you tell them that holiness is right, if you tell them you can't do all of that and still be a Christian, we live in a time where people get mad and walk out of your church. But your pastor should be able to correct you and still be your pastor. And if you can walk out of this church because you have been disciplined, then that wasn't your pastor. 
Ooh, I'm sorry, Pat. Because real pastors want to see you be developed. They want to train you. So they put you in sometimes unpopular positions and uncomfortable situations. But it's not designed to kill you. It's designed to develop you. Why I got to stand out here and do this? Why I got to show up and do outreach? Why I got to be here on time? God said, I'm developing you. And if you can take it, if you can take it, if you can stand there long enough, and recognize that even though they may be putting you in a tough situation, I may be in a prison, but it doesn't change my prophecy. My situation looks bad right now, but it doesn't change my prophecy. Because in my painful place, God begins to develop my gift. I want to talk to somebody here that's in a painful situation. It's uncomfortable. It's cramped. And here's what's so frustrating about it. My gift is so strong, even in this place, that I'm blessing other people. And I'm not even helping myself. Is there anybody in here that knows the frustration of being able to tell other people what to do? That your gift is so strong, your word of wisdom is so strong, that you're helping other people with their marriage while yours are still the mess? That you're able to tell people, you're able to speak over somebody else's child while your child is still struggling? Is there anybody that knows what it's like to lay hands on somebody and they get healed and you're still going to the doctor? But here's where integrity takes over and say, God, I'm still going to operate in my gift until you change my situation. I'm going to let you develop my gift. I'm going to let you develop my character. I'm going to hold on to my integrity. I'm going to be who I'm supposed to be. I'm not going to be hateful. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be jealous. Lord, work on me. Strong people are not developed in comfortable places. They're developed in uncomfortable places. Strong people are not developed in easy places. They're developed in cramped places, uneasy places, places that nobody else would sign up for. God put you there because he knew you wouldn't sign up for it. If he asked you, did you want to go through that, you would say no. So God doesn't ask you because God is more committed to your development than he is to your comfort. And God will just set up the situation and arrange things to happen. While you're saying it's unfair, God is saying, I put you there for a reason. I had to put you in a situation to develop the gift of, oh, my God. I had to put you in something and get you alone so that I could get you to develop your gift and your character. And this is where you get to train. I'm trying to tell somebody in here that God has got you where he has for training. God is developing you in a cramped place. I want to talk to somebody in here right now who your life feels restricted. And you're wondering how long am I going to be in this restricted place? How long am I going to be the one to help other people go forward and I'm not going forward? I helped you get up on your feet. I helped you get where you're trying to go. I helped your marriage, and I'm still, and, and what makes it worse is that he was forgotten about. Anybody ever been forgotten about? Anybody ever been there for somebody, helped somebody, prayed for somebody, ran out there and looked out for somebody, but when it was your turn, you couldn't find them? Anybody ever made sacrifices so that somebody else's life could be better and they weren't there when it was your turn? God said, I'm about to turn the tables. I'm about to turn the tables. Because here's my last thing. God used pain to position him. God created a problem where the Pharaoh couldn't interpret a dream. Nobody could tell him what it meant. They called Joseph out of, the, out, of the pit, out of the prison because they had seen him operate in his gift. I'm trying to tell somebody, be consistent with your gift. Even if nobody's paying attention, God is paying attention. 
Even if nobody is noticing, God is noticing. And sometimes God is, depend- is, 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 is making sure that your future opportunities are based on your attitude right now. Am I in the right church? That sometimes God is just trying to see how you're going to act in this space to determine where he's going to take you. And here came a problem. And the problem was a setup. The problem was God setting the stage. If you want to know where your anointing is, find a problem. God is making you into a problem solver. For somebody, you're going to be the answer to their prayers. For somebody, God is making you into somebody that's going to change their life. The problem creates an opportunity for you. If you want to know where you're going to be the most effective, find a problem. If you want to know where your anointing is going to flow, find a problem. Be an answer to somebody's question. Be a solution to somebody's problem. God is developing you into a person that is going to be an answer to somebody's prayer. Oh, my God, I wish somebody heard me in here. There's somebody waiting for you to arrive. There's somebody waiting for you to come out of your foolishness, attitude, hatefulness, anger, frustration. They're waiting for you to come out of it because I'm waiting. I'm an answer. Maybe that's why I've been going through what I'm going through, Lisa, because I'm an, I, I'm an answer. Can you receive the fact that sometimes what God has taken you through is not for you? That sometimes the things that God has taken me through is not even about me, but it's about you. That when I get up and preach, I'm not preaching something that I read. I'm preaching something that I lived, and I can tell you what the other side looks like because I've been where you've been. I've had what you had, and I saw God bring me out. If there's anybody here that God has ever brought you out of something, give God a shout right here. Where my witness is at? Where my witness is at? Where my witness is at? I'm an ex felon I'm an ex crackhead. I'm an ex drug dealer. I'm an ex prostitute, but God brought me. I don't want you talking to me if you ain't never been through nothing. I don't want you trying to minister to me if you've never been broken. I don't want you talking to me if you haven't been where I've been. I need somebody that's been where I've been to understand what I'm saying. God's going to send some of us back out to the field. I done brought you into the pit. I done brought you into the prison. And now I'm about to put you in the palace. And you'll know that you're in that place when you can look back over your life and say it wasn't you, but it was God that brought me here. You meant it for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You'll know you're in the right place and the right attitude when you can look back and say, God, I take I'm going to shut up after this, I think. See, here's what I want you to get. Throughout the whole thing, throughout the whole course of his life, from, from, from the pit to the prison to the palace, the one thing that was consistent was God. That his hand was on Joseph from the pit to the prison, to the palace. That Joseph didn't make it there because he was so smart. He didn't get out of the pit because he was so good. He didn't get out of the prison because he was so good. And he wasn't even qualified to be in the palace because he was so good. It was just that the hand of his God. My hands remain strong. 
My resolve remained strong. My fortitude was in place because of something down on the inside. My hand of my God was upon me. See, the problem with some of us is you think it's you. You think it's about how strong you are, how smart you are, how intelligent you are, how educated you are. But God says that the reason you made it this far was because my hand. Oh, I got to go sit down because I just feel something hit me in the back of the head. My hand was upon you. Everything was set up against you and you shouldn't even be in here. But the fact that my hand is upon you. Is there anybody that can testify that I'm in this place because God's hand? When I was ready to commit suicide, it was God's hand. When it was ready to kill me, it was God's hand. Sickness didn't take me out because of God's hand. The devil didn't take me out because of God's hand. Somebody give God a shout for the hand. Oh, I wish I had some happy people in here. I wish I had some happy people in here who can shout and give God a praise because his hand, his hand, his hand, his hand. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say, the hand of the Lord is upon you. The hand of the Lord is upon you. The hand of the Lord is upon you. The hand of the Lord. Marco, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. I shouldn't even be here. I shouldn't even be standing. But the hand of the Lord. They wonder why I shout like I do, Brother Balmondo. But they don't understand that it's the hand of the Lord. I shouldn't even have what I have. I shouldn't even be where I am. I shouldn't even stand where I stand. But because God, oh my God. Somebody take 30 seconds and thank God for his hand. His hand. His hand. His hand is stronger than my problem. His hand is stronger.
right. If you're going to really do this right, you got to get yourself some room. You know, push on somebody and say, give me some room. Give me some room. I need some room. You got to push on somebody. Give me some space. Give me some space. Because for what God done for me, you're not going to be able to hold me in this little space. Give me some room. Give me some space. Let me get my dance in. Let me get my shout in. Let me get my go in. Come on and get it done. right here. Lift your hands right here. I want you to say this to me, say this for me. By faith, the hand of the Lord is upon me. Yeah, the hand of the Lord is upon me. And his hand upon me is stronger than anything that's trying to keep me down. His hand on me is stronger than anything that's trying to keep me tied up. It's stronger than alcohol. It's stronger than sex. It's stronger than drugs. It's stronger than porn. It's stronger than witchcraft. Oh my God. The hand of the Lord is upon me. It's stronger than depression. It's stronger than cancer. I call into place everything that would try to stand up against you. I command that thing to bow its knee in the name of Jesus. 
The hand of the Lord is upon you right now. The hand of the Lord is upon you. The hand of the Lord is upon you. And I command you to come out now. 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 Pastor Marco, but before I do, I, I wonder if there's somebody in here that the enemy is trying to hold you down, keep you bound, make you feel like I'm never going to get up, I'm never going to get out. I want to come to tell you that the hand of the Lord is upon you to break every addiction to break every habit. Jesus is a habit breaker. Where are my witnesses at? Jesus is a habit breaker. If you're in here right now, I ain't got a lot of time. You need to rush this altar right now. If you want Jesus to break that thing over your life, come all the way out of it. I break every fetter, and I break every chain, and I break every addiction, and I cast down every devil, and I cast down every stronghold, and I break every chain. I want out! I want out! I want out! They're coming from all over the room. Shake yourself and come out of that. Shake yourself and come out of there. I call you out of it. I call you out of your comfortable place. I call you out of your problem. I call you out of your addiction. The hand of the Lord is upon you. This is the last time I'm struggling with this. This is the last time I'm rushing with this. That's the last time I'm dealing with this. Come out of it. I see you back there, brother. Come out of it. Here they come. Here they come. The devil thought you were going to get through this and still be tied up. 
The devil is a liar. Here they come. Here they come. They're coming from all over the room. The white folks are coming. The black folks are coming. The red folks are coming. The poor folks are coming. The young people are coming. The old people are coming. all over this altar. I want you to lift your hand and begin to give God glory. Point your hands this way. Deliverance is happening all over this altar. Come on. Come on. The devil thought he had somebody tied up, but God is breaking it right now. He's breaking it tonight. The devil said he's going to still control you, but the Lord is breaking that chain tonight. Come on out of it. Chains are falling. I hear chains falling. I hear chains falling. I hear chains falling. I hear chains falling. 